Welcome to Twitter Jobs here at Sunrise at Sea. I'm Heston Munenra, and uh, you know we discuss uh, most of what is going around on social media. But this morning, we are discussing Uganda's state, uh, Uganda's uh, the state of Uganda's economy. I'm Heston Munenra, and we know the talk in town in the villages. It is more of the economy, the economy, the economy. Well, the World Bank says uh, that. This financial year, it has, Uganda has grown unprecedentedly uh, at 4.6. And also, uh, Uganda Revenue Authority came out and said, you know, it had met its, it had actually exceeded its target in revenue collection uh, by this first quarter of there. But, you know, with all the figures and uh, the figures given by these institutions, even World Bank in its report comes out and says that, you know, the fundamentals of the economy are still strong. But amidst all these figures, the mismatch between the figures and the actual reality on ground is what we are going to discuss this morning. Well, we were supposed to be having Honorable Akaima Musoke, uh, NUP Member of Parliament for Nasana Municipality. But, you know, uh, constraints here and there and also the jam maybe this early morning, uh, maybe could have kept him at bay. But he will join us uh, later on as we progress in the discussion. But in the studio right, right about now, I'm having uh, Executive Director for Siatini Uganda, uh, Miss Jen Nalunga, to discuss with me uh, this topic. Uh, welcome to the show, Madam Jen. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, it's been, it's, been, it's been a long time since we, we, were, on set to, we yeah. were on set together. Yes, yes, it has been a while. Yeah. And maybe I could say good morning our our viewers. Yes. Um, mm. Let's begin. Maybe I'll, before we maybe get into how did we get here in the first place? Weren't there any sort of economic forecast that we could get into this or it just came and there we see it and there we handle it uh, head on? Um, you know, when you ask how did we get here, I think we need to be clear exactly where we are, the here. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, because like what you have said, um, the figures are okay. In fact, um, our, our, the, the economists are telling us you are, you are not bad off like other countries. Your GDP is so much, you are growing at, you said 4.6% and yes, all yeah. that. Um, when you look at the figures, because when the, the economists say our GDP is going up, you know, or oh, it's okay, they are looking at all goods and services traded within a country. It doesn't mean that those goods and services are going, going to benefit the country. It doesn't mean that you and me are going to get a pie, a part of that that money. So sometimes it's really important to look at the human development indicators, you know, although you can say the economy is growing, but who is growing, who is getting the benefit of that growth? Sometimes it might not even be the country, because you look at our country today, where we are in actual terms, hmm? the country is indebted, you know, really, really indebted. No, because we can't generate enough funds. Our ends can't meet what we need and the resources are available. That's why we are, we are borrowing. You know, people are poor, they have no jobs. The young people, you are lucky. You are seated here, <laughs> you know. Other people are not as lucky as you are. There is a lot of unemployment. Our production and productivity has gone down, you know. We are not export. What we are exporting is raw, you know. In fact, when you look at our exports, still coffee, gold, but coffee in the raw form, gold in the raw form. Then we add on some maize, some eggs, some avocados, some fish. You know, that's where that's where we are. And when you ask, how did we come to be where we are? where we are poor, you know, and the poverty levels are going up. When you look at the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. it's, it's also a watershed in our economic trajectory, you know. Um, the COVID pandemic, 
really battered our economy. Not just ours, but globally. Global All the global, you know, economies had challenges, even in the developed countries. But we need to consider that even before there were those long-standing challenges. Because Uganda we have been poor. We are poor. And I think that's what should sink in the minds of our policy makers. That's why we are designated as a least developing country, LDC. LDC is that category of people who are poor, the countries which are really poor at the bottom of the ladder, and Uganda is one of them. I'm emphasizing this for us to be able to know where we are and be able to put, uh, to put uh, 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 strategies in place to be able to get out. Because some people, there is this notion that, oh, Uganda, we are doing okay, we are fine, the economic gro growth is so much, we are growing economically, you know, we economic growth, we are better than this country, that our debt is okay, we are better than the US, their debt is high, you know. But I think we need to put issues in perspective. Yes, uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, 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 I like to maybe maybe you explain to our viewer that where are we now? Are we in in what maybe in economics there was a, uh, that takeoff stage, or we have gone back even we are not even at the takeoff uh, takeoff stage. We see the fuel prices maybe have slowed down by a few you know digits. Uh, so where are we? Are we as bad as we were when everyone was maybe feel, people are still feeling it, but how is your, what is the economic weather as of now? Uh, maybe you remember when there was that debate whether we have entered the middle income mm -hmm. status, yeah, where, whether we are at the threshold. And I remember the World Bank came out clearly and said, no, we are not yet there. And World Bank said that if we continue, you know, the way the, way the economy is moving, you know, we might take a number of years to go into, into uh, the middle income status. Those are not my words, mm -hmm. that's World Bank. And I think where we are, it's not a very good place. It's not really a good place. Because for an economy to grow, and that's why I want us to look at fundamentals, instead of looking, okay, the fundamentals which you said, yes. of, not those fundamentals of economic growth, 4.6% for, for and all that. For me, I think what we really need to look at is asking ourselves really hard questions around employment, you know, around production, around industrialization, you know. Those are issues which you can touch on and be able to say our economy is really on a takeoff stage, being able to know that we are producing, we have increased our productivity, we are exporting to this market. Mm? Being able to know that now we have so many industries, you know, which are providing jobs, but which are also providing backward and forward linkages between the producers and the market, yeah. you know, and people are getting jobs. Mm -hmm. Being able to know that we can be able to feed ourselves, that people are not dying of hunger. You know, we are looking at that economy, and that's what we call the real, real economy. You know, not the figure economy of economic growth for point six. Yeah, yeah, true. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. because uh, most pundits have, I don't know, and people that are very uh, you know, economic experts are very lyrical on figures. But when you really, on the day-to-day -day basis of the people we really interact with, the struggles they face, they don't seem to be in touch with these figures, and they just really think that maybe the experts seem to be living in another country that they are not living in. So what causes that mismatch? Is it because of the scientific figures are just a sample space or they reflect the real reality of economic growth? Uh, maybe, maybe another issue which we need to separate really is um, separate the economics, economics and the economy. Economics can help us to explain mm, some of what's going on, you know, in the, in the economy. But economics is not everything. 
you know, because we need to look at how do we trade, how do we get out of uh, this issue. Economics can help, you know, looking at the figures and all that, GDP growth, but it isn't the end of it. There is a very interesting book. In fact, I wanted to bring it. Next time you invite me, yes. I will show it to you yeah. uh, by Professor Eric Reynard, very renowned professor. Uh, he wrote a book, Why Developed Countries, Why Rich Countries Are Rich and Why Poor Countries Stay Poor. And one of the issues was that instead of looking at economics and figures, let us look at the history of economics. What did those countries do? Countries like Japan, countries like you know European countries, what did they do to become rich? What are those policies? What are those policies they put in place? You know? So and I found that it's a, I, will, I will show it to you, yes. you know, very good book, so many lessons. And for me, I think when we are looking at our economy and how to get out of that, this problem, we can learn lessons, hmm? lessons, eh, because now, like I said, all countries were battered by the COVID pandemic, but countries are moving. What have they done? to move, what examples can we copy from those countries? I just want to give you an example, and I usually give that example of Kenya. Kenya negotiated, you know, Kenya is growing avocados, avocados, eh? has avocados, but they have negotiated a market with the China, Chinese. the Chinese. Even the quality of the avocados, that these are the, what we want. Because at first, China said, mm -mm, we want the avocados frozen at maybe negative 40%. You know. But afterwards, they were able to negotiate. These are the type of avocado we want, hard cover, this size. These are the pesticides we want you to use. We don't want was pesticides, you know, and they were able to reach an agreement. Now, Kenya is exporting avocados to Kenya, to China. And they're even getting them from people like you and me who have maybe a half an acre, as long as you do what's right, you know, you do the right seedling, the right fertilizers, the right pesticides, the right handling. And government is playing a role ensuring that their storage facilities, collection centers. What am I getting at is that we need to plan. Maybe now we are going into what needs to be done, you know, but we need to learn. And where we are today as a country, we need, uh, there is a saying that we need waves big waves we ca which can lift yeah, a number of boats out of the harbor but what we are looking what we are seeing today is these jointed efforts pdm hmm? you then don't know what they are producing under pdm yeah. you know then you hear some people In say yoga. Mioga, you know then you hear people producing onions i don't know where they take them you know, which is okay, but we need to reorganize our production. We need to reorganize our agriculture. We need to link it to industrialization and then to markets. And that, that entire chain needs policies, needs resources, needs negotiations, which we need to put in place. Yeah, Madam, Madam Jane, just uh, briefly, what seemingly are the bottlenecks uh, before maybe i go to some of the bigger questions what are the bottlenecks the ugandan economy is facing because some of the experts seem to say we are suffering from imported inflation for most i think i saw professor professor mohumza and peddling that that narrative that per se maybe our internal economy may be uh, just is just suffering from imported inflation from other countries 
being that Uganda is integrated in the global exactly. economy. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it is true that what happens globally affects us because we are part of a global economy. We are globalized. Uh, like they say, if another country gets a cough, we sneeze, which is okay. But then it also depends on how, you know, on how you plan, how you reorganize your economy to be able to withstand the pressures from outside. So you, you, you don't let yourself open to those global forces. You organize because within those global forces, there are also benefits which you can be able to, to harvest. There are markets out there. Take an example of COVID happened. The Ukraine war happened, you know. Ukraine, they are telling us because of the war, people are dying of hunger, they don't have sunflower oil, you know. But we can be able to grow sunflower. How long does it take to grow sunflower? Hmm? Three months, four months. The product is already there. So, so you scan the environment. There are challenges in the environment, but there are also opportunities. You look at how you address the, ch the opportunities and how you address the challenges. I, I have a very interesting, some interesting questions from some of our viewers here, and maybe I found it. But it says, at the moment, government coffers seem to be empty, yet government is the biggest fund of most projects. What explains this predicament? Yeah, government, um, government coffers are Seem to be. Seem to be, but government has been borrowing. Um, government at any one time will have resources. They might not be a lot, but they do have resources, either from loans, from grants, or from our taxes. But government has resources. But the whole issue is how does government use those resources to be able to generate more resources. And I think this is a, the challenge which we have today, which our country has today, that we are indebted. Government coffers are empty because government, like now there was this debate, government borrowing 1.7 trillion uh, from a Japanese insurance company via Standard, Standard Chartered Bank. Bank. And when you look at w where that money is going to go, we ask ourselves, should that money really go there? Because, Esther, when you are where you are now, you want to get a loan, you know? And that loan you need to repay it, and you need to develop. Where should you put your money? You might be hard pressed to say, maybe I need another, sure. Maybe I need to go out for a drink. Maybe I need another suit. But then you say, no, let me invest it so that the money which comes out of that can be able to buy a shoe, isn't it? Yes. So, so the whole issue now is how do we use our mega resources prudently, you know, so that we can generate more resources. And what you are asking, what do we do? I think that's where we need also to start from. Mm? We are indebted, we have challenges of resources, but how are we using the little resources we have? You know? And when you look at where we are today, I don't think we are prudently using our resources. For example, this 1.7 trillion, I hear, because I haven't heard from Parliament pronouncing themselves on this issue, that this money is also going to be used to build um, a conference hall in Munyonyo Resort Center. Is that a priority or not? You know? So it goes back to what I said, understanding where we are, the challenges which we have and how we get out of it. And we plan, and we say, if our problem you know, is about generating resources, growing the economy, increasing production and productivity, being able to industrialize, being able to trade, where do we put our money? Do we put it in a conference center 
or not? Or do we put more money in our grow industrialization to be able to produce more, you know? So for me, those are the challenges we are facing today. Um, in, uh, I think at the beginning of this year, I got a chance to read uh, the, your position on the, on the National Budget Framework Paper. Mm. And uh, I, I, I strongly, you had a, a very, very brilliant view that, you know, for Uganda's development to, you know, take some leap, leaps and bounds in this budget, focus should be on, yes, PDM agro-industrialization and also focusing on tourism. And when you look at that, in this budget, little focus. In fact, I, I had an interaction with some of the tourism officials, and they, they, they are really, they are really disappointed that tourism that generates almost colossal sums of money into our GDP, into our economy, is not given a lot of attention. Trade and agro industrialization that should be the backbone of our economy are not being given that amount of attention as face it that would get us out of this impasse uh -huh. so do you is, don't you find that frustrating after all these brilliant policies he actually puts uh, forward on these different uh, forums don't I, you? I, I i think they they, they um there have been a number of other organization and people calling for um prudent reallocation of our resources and also talking about issues of agro industrialization uh, because you see we went into program based budgeting uh, where you put programs together so that programs can be able to speak to each other you know uh, being able to uh, to 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 break the silos and i think that's how issues around um capital development uh, that's the um, Human capital, human capital, capital development, development so yeah. that you put health, education, water together because that's about the human, you know, the people. And that's why agro-industrialization also is put together that when you produce, you have to industrialize, isn't it? You, you do industries, which was very good. But again, what you are saying, when you look at the money, which has been put in agro-industrialization. Because when we talk about agro-industrialization, we are talking about agriculture, then trade and industry. Very little money. I think it was around 1.4 trillion. That's pocket change for some people. Hmm? 1.4 trillion, you know, very little money. And then again, when you look at the way the agro-industrialization program is being implemented. Trade again is on its own. You go to the ministry, to, to, to parliament, there is no agro-industrialization committee. Committee is still agriculture, trade. You know, and you see there is that lack of you know, integration of the two, two programs. That, that's why we produce, hmm? when it comes to marketing, there are no markets. We produce markets, they say the standards, mm -mm, the standard is not good. Those products, we don't want them, you know? So that lack of coherence in our planning is really a problem. And it goes back to planning. We have failed to plan. One time, I was, was with some top policy makers and I made a proposal hmm, that we need a planning unit. I don't mind whether it's a, a ministry altogether. You remember, we, no, you, you, you were not yet born. Mm -hmm. Way back, minis, planning was on its own. Ministry of yes, Planning. Yes, planning. But we have the National Planning Authority. Yeah, but, but it's, uh, for me, I don't think it's independent enough. We need, and we need, we need it resourced, you know, to be able to plan, to project. You know, when you plan very well, the work is half done, by the way. Mm? But when you don't plan, you would always be in circles. Take an example of PDM. Mm? PDM, if it was food, it's half cooked. It needs to, still to be in the kitchen. And that's 
lack of planning, planning for this country. If you don't plan very well, you know, and if you don't know exactly what you want to achieve, any destination will be enough, isn't it? Yeah, true. Hmm? true. Well, in this, I, I don't know whether you will agree with me that isn't this time for high time for government to put some bit of austerity in its public spending and in these austerity measures channel what comes out of austerity into those sectors that would be able to boost our economy? You know, terms are very diff uh, problematic. The moment you talk about austerity measures, it isn't a good term. Hmm? Uh, it goes back to the World Bank. In fact, even to civil society are saying no austerity measures. Because austerity measures means cutting on expenditures especially on social services education health which is not very good when we talk about prudent use of our resources hmm, we are looking at for example the administrative burden the many constituencies is it possible to merge some constituencies we look at government agencies, because government had already started on that process of merging UIA, um, the Uganda Investment Authority, uh, maybe putting it back in Ministry of Trade or Finance, looking at the Re Uganda Roads Authority, you know, mar merging, you know, looking at efficiency and effectiveness, you know. so so. For me, those are not austerity measures. You know, they are not. But it's also looking at rationalization of our expenditure, which we need to do. We ca it can't be business as usual. But maybe we haven't really been pushed against the wall. That's why it's business as usual. We borrow to put money in salaries. We borrow to put money to build another conference center. You know, maybe we haven't really understood, appreciated the gravity of the situation. Maybe that's why our, for our government it's business, business as usual. So, uh, Madam Jen, what now does, do we need to do? Because mm. the, the viewer out there, there's a person who's really hard up financially, mm. their child has not actually even managed to finish uh, mm. P7, he's out there, you know, they're all stranded. Let us speak to these people. What should be done? And as, as, as you talk, I think most of the MDAs, the ministries, the departments, and the agencies as well, in the circles, we, they are also complaining quietly in the corridors. They have not received something in months. What do we need to do? Um... I think as a country, we need to rethink so many things. You know, when you are in a problem, hmm, sometimes you are, it's adrenaline, you want to act. Hmm? And I think that's uh, how the government came up with a PDM. You want to show you are moving, you know, which sometimes is not right, you know. Um, it's like when you, I, I, I'm not a, um, a, 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 an army person. My son used to be in the UK army. She used to, he used to explain some of these things, you know, that sometimes when you are in a, a very dire situation, sit back, reorganize your resources, then attack, knowing exactly how you are going to attack and also understanding the enemy. In Uganda, we need to understand, you know, where we are, you know. So we need to go back on the drawing board. This is the situation, the way it is. Where do we want to go? And how do we reach there? What do we need to discard? What do we need to go with? Hmm? Who should we move with? For example, in the global economy, how do we negotiate what we want to? to achieve. All that will require planning. Then we need also to plan who should do what. You know, today you look at some 
ministries are going that road, the other ones are going there, those ones are going there. Take an example of the PDA. Even the officers at the district level and the parish level don't know even up to now what they are supposed to be doing. I remember some people were joking that people ate the money, you know, mm. those yeah, scandals have been, people yeah. eating, you know, the extent, stealing yeah. the money. Even there was a headline, I think it was in the monitor, that, mm. uh, you know, the rules are now being re, <laughs> you know, they're being rewritten again. And to my head, actually, I was moving to church when I saw that, and I was like, God, what is going on in our country? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, what... PDM in its sense, uh, uh, people had, I don't know why people were predicting doomsday from the word go. Because there was no plan. Because they, they, they were like, this is going to die at stillbirth. And, uh, and now it turns out to be, looks like their prediction, despite the political washing away of, uh, of that possibility, mm. it's likely to become like OWC, Intandikwa, Bonava, Gagawale. And yet these are good, these, these are good, uh, good initiatives but maybe you i would like you to react on what what extent has uganda's debt burden you know contributed to these current tough economic times is there okay. any correlation uh, maybe before we go to that date but on the issue of the pdm yeah. some people are saying those officers i don't know whether it's a joke or not that for them they thought pdm is the same as per diem Wow. Because uh, it's almost <laughs> the same, is it? PDM per DM. Wow. So that's why they ate their money. Penny. Wow. But that tells us that lack of planning, lack of pulling in the same direction, understanding where we are and where we want to go, and understanding that this is the vehicle we are going to use to achieve a certain objective, to reach a certain di destination. We don't have it. So people at the top decide PDM. By the time it reaches down, things have changed into PDM, yeah. and the money is eaten. <laughs> That's a crazy one, yeah. Okay, so <laughs> now, when it comes to the issue of the date, the date burden, the debt burden is huge. Hmm? They are telling us it's about 78, 78 trillion. But the figure is also not very clear because some people say 78 trillion. But they don't add on where government has guaranteed. Because when government guarantees your project, you know, and you don't pay, government has to pay that so so part of government's responsibility and obligation. Uh, that there are also monies which government borrowed from the central bank. So at the end of that day, even if we take 78 trillion, that's a lot of money because our budget is around 40, 40, 4, 48 trillion, trillion, yeah. you know? So it's double our entire, mm, our entire, entire budget. But the challenge, because some people have been saying, you know, the economists tell us, no, we are still okay. You know, um, US, somebody was giving an example of the US, that the US, their debt is even higher. It's around 200%. Percent. Percent. Yeah. Japan, but the, in, the gravity of the indebtedness depends on the capacity to pay. In fact, for us as uh, civil society, we have been saying, let us look at other parameters to show whether our debt is sustainable. Looking at, for example, how much of our resources do we pay to service that debt? Hmm? Because the US, the US, they print their money, they have the dollars, you know? They can afford to continue, despite the debt, to continue. Hmm? The incessant borrowing. Yeah, to continue providing social services. But for us, if you are paying hmm, your debt, the debt repayment is more than you spend on education, you spend on water, you spend on health, you spend on 
uh, trade combined and you are servicing your debt. Is that debt sustainable? It isn't. It isn't. It isn't. So we need to look at it that. And we have gone to the extent of borrowing to service to our service. debt. So you, you dig this hole to cover this one, then, you know, and th the process continues. And that's why today we are talking about debt cancellation. They cancel the date, date the scheduling. But again, we need again to see why are we where we are. Because there was a debt cancellation under the HIPIC initiative some time mm -hmm. back, mm -hmm. you know. But we are back again on that table. That's why we need to reflect why are we where we are, you know. But also sometimes the debt conditionalities Sometimes they don't allow us to do what we are supposed to do. Because debt, being indebted is slavery, sure. you know? Take like an example, if your neighbor is the one you are indebted, no, let's, you know? let's say my landlord. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to greet the landlord no, very well, exactly. isn't it? Yes, yeah. The landlord, the, when the landlord, you know, you can even fear to cook meat. In, 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 in case you, you, you are near your landlord and you haven't paid, how do you eat meat when you haven't paid, you know? So, so it's those linkages, you know, those conditionalities which we need to discuss. But at the end of the day, I think as a country, we need to be able to go back on the drawing board as a country, understand where we are and we can be, for me, I believe Mm? we can be able to get out of this situation. Yeah, yeah. We can be able to feed ourselves. I don't see a country like Uganda saying we are, that we, we can't feed ourselves. In fact, I was telling some people, I was in a, uh, in a conference recently in German, somebody was talking about, you see, the Ukraine war and food, and I said no don't t tell us about food in Africa because I don't eat food which comes from Ukraine. I don't eat rice. I don't eat those things. We grow our matoke, we grow our millet, we grow our cassava and potatoes, you know? We are not. You know, b because at the end of the day, hmm, what is so, so important, and it's also about the issue of being indebted, you know, is the issue of rules losing your self-respect, you know, as a people, you know. You know, when people say starving Africans, you know, you can't even put on your suit and feel nice mm. in a conference, yeah? Starving Africans, you know, it, it takes away some, our self-respect, you know, and we shouldn't allow that. I, I recently tweeted on my handle and said that uh, there has always been a conversation in the public space about uh, debt sustainability, but there's, there is little to do with whether we will ever get out of this vicious cycle of debt. And, and, and that is a little bit worrying because if policymakers and the, and, and the political parachute aren't talking, having discussions on to project us into getting out of debt, but they are instead talking about how we can sustain, sustain exactly. our debt. There could exactly. be a problem. Exactly. And that's the entire challenge, you know, that we should be looking at exiting aid, exiting debt, you know, not sustaining it. Hmm? It's like somebody sustaining somebody on life support, you know, the moment you switch off, that person is gone. So, so at the end of the day, I think we need to look at our resources and be able to say, how do we use our resources? Proudly, proudly Ugandans, proudly Africans to be able to exit all this debt and aid. Uh, I think one of um, one of the popular musicians sang, you know, made, made a song and said, take a cent or whatever. And, and, <laughs> and uh, to you, I would like to, where should we put our money in terms of even the mega resources, where we see we can get maybe, okay, in the short term and long term dividends that would help catapult us uh -huh. out of where we are? Uh -huh. Where should we put our money? 
we, we should put our money in the human capital development because our most valued asset is we. We, you and me, the people, you know, health people, you know, people who are educated, you know. Let us put our resources there. First of all, you know, first of all, let people have health, education, issues of water. Hmm? A health population is a health nation. You know? Ensure that our education is okay. You know? I remember there was a time when Ugandan doctors and teachers were, you know, everywhere you go, you know. I, I finished my university at a time when the situation was not very good and I'm a teacher, I'm a trained teacher. All my colleagues, Kenya, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Canada. You go to Canada, most of the teachers my age are mostly Ugandans, you know. So that was the quality of education, you know. You wouldn't ask, you just say, I want to be, I want a job. Where are you from? I'm from Uganda. Good, you know. So we put our money there. Then we put our money in the productive sectors. Uganda is an agricultural country. Mm -hmm. We are agri whatever you say, this is an agricultural country, you know, and we can't wish it away. And for me, I think we can be able to use the, our agriculture and our small scale producers to produce for ourselves to produce our food but also to produce for our industries and exports so we put our money in agriculture and when we say agriculture it's plant crops animals forest we put our money there and also our resources like minerals we put our money there then the entire chain, agriculture, industry, then trade, you market, you know. And that value chain, that chain is not easy, you know. Like I said, there are policies to be put in place. For example, markets, markets are negotiated. You don't just say people produce, we are going to, where are you going to sell the products? When it comes to producing for the market, negotiate the market first. Like the example I gave you okay. uh, of avocado, mm. negotiate the market. And the market's out there. We have come up with a paper here, looking at how do we move forward. We have enumerated the markets yeah, which Uganda has negotiated. European Union has told, told us a long time ago bring everything but not arms no guns bring everything today when we take our paper and our vegetables they say mm -mm, the standard is not very good but the market is there and the people on this hand are saying where do we put our resources our products people producing pineapples you have seen them hmm? there is a link with the market the market is not there you know, yet there is a colleague who is studying in German. He was telling us he's buying mm, um, dried pineapples, but from Tanzania, is it 30 euros or 40 euros a packet? Oh. Mm? So how do we reorganize our market so that we have incomes at household level, and also at national level. Because at national level, unless government has income there, you know, the debt will continue. Government won't be having money to reinvest in those productive resources because we are servicing the loans. Government won't have money to put in the human development capital because we are servicing debts and the cycle will Continue. On and on. Well, um, uh, as a student of law as well, uh, mm. there's, there's, a dic there, there's a maxim that says that uh, he who seeks equity uh, must come with clean hands. Mm. So 
what would you think do you think Uganda's rival political tension, this was supposed to be for the politician, has anything to do with the current tough economic times that, you know, when two elephants fight, seemingly the grass must suffer? Okay. You are talking about clean hands and... <laughs> and, and equity. Equity. Yes, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I will start with that, you know. We talked about corruption, the PDM how people are eating that money, you know. And the issue of transparency, the issues of accountability, the issue of how we are using our resources is a challenge. Some people, not me, are saying we have late hyenas look after our goats. And that's a problem. So we need also to address that issue, you know, issue of corruption. No issues of transparency, accountability. accountability. How do we use our resources? We are diverting resources. For example, the PDM, hmm? it isn't good, it isn't very well conceived, but at least it can do if that little money, you know, is put to some use hmm? and not being eaten as per DM, you know, at least something can come out of it. But now that money is squandered, squandered, stolen, eaten by two, three people. You know, that's a challenge. You know, and it's a cancer which is eating our our economy. And also, it goes even the way we plan. Because if I'm corrupt and I'm seated here, you know, when we are discussing government plans, I will look at me. Eh? I look at me, where should that money go, where I can be able to get my hands on it, you know? If a road is being constructed, we, won't go, we are not going to get a good road which can last three, four, or ten years, or twenty years. We are going to get a road which is going to last maybe one year, they are potholes, you know? So the issue of clean hands is also affecting our, our economy. Yes, mm. and, uh, and and also, uh, what would you, do you think this, I, I, I always argue that corruption could be, because people want, especially the politicians, want to look at sort of institutional corruption, but I think it boils down to, it's a moral issue, and because in these institu institutions do not just, systems do not work, they have human beings behind them, and so when you do not deal with the moral fabric of these people, these individuals in these institutions, then you're shooting first and aiming later. Yeah, but, but it, it, it can be both ways, the people and the institution. But I think we need to strengthen the institutions. Um, because all of us are corruptible. Hmm? All of us, nobody is clean. And given a chance, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> you never know what you can do. Temptations are there, you know. So, so... Um, it's important that we strengthen our systems, our institutions. We need checks and balances, you know. We need those systems to keep us on the narrow path. It isn't that other countries, they are not corrupt, you know. They are corrupt people, mm. you know. Yeah. They are corrupt people, you know. But the system keeps you on the narrow path. And you know that if I go off that narrow path, hmm? the repercussions are dire. I go to prison, you know, I lose my property. Then you say, maybe let me, you know, check myself, you know. But at the end of the day, it's the institutions have to be strong, you know, to have those checks and balances. But if the institutions are not working, you know, if people are corrupt and they get away with it, you know, then people are tempted also to, to say, if so and so can do it, why not me? You know, I'm also dying. Why should I die of poverty? But if the institutions are working, that can be also good. But also the morals, it's really important, you know, you know to, to have a population and a generation, you know, which are morally right, 
which shun away from corruption, you know, where you can be able to say, mm, how, what will people say, you know, what will my family say, you know, if they hear, if they see me in newspapers that I have stolen so much, you know. So it, it's both ways. The institutions have to be strong, but also individuals the individuals now, now yeah the global trend now especially mm. in the political climate i would say mm. we see britain having uh, seemingly impending leadership crisis though mm. it was solved mm. and the issue was growth growth economy right now in the midterm elections in the usa the first stop in i, I think it was the gallup uh, the gallup poll and 49 percent of that poll of the pollsters indicate that the the major issue deciding the midterm elections is the economy and inflation mm. worldwide. Mm. That is why right now the Republicans seem to be gaining the House of Representatives mm. and mm. and gaining also the Senate. Is mm. can it is that could that be the trend? Because when you look at what is happening that side, you really feel Ugandans are not up to anything because they seem to be resigned back into what do I put on the table? But it is not an issue to galvanize some sort of civic abstance uh, mm. demanding more accountability mm. from government. Mm. What is your reaction as we head to the tail end? Okay, yes. uh, th that's a very interesting question. Uh, just yesterday, I came back from Dar es Salaam. We are having a meeting with uh, one of the German foundations. And you know, for the German government, each party has a foundation, mm? each party. Uh, for example, if, for example, here in Uganda, NRM would have a foundation. NUP, FDC, DP, they have foundations. To do political education, you know, to educate, that we call it civic education yes, here, yes. to educate their people as regards their ideology. Because each party, you stand for something, you know. For example, the social democrats, you have talked about the republicans, yes. the democrats. Yes, yeah. You already know in the U.S. One is conservative and uh -huh. the other is liberal. Uh -huh. yeah. When it comes to this issue, the republicans, this is what they think. For us here in Africa, we don't have that, you know. And it's a big problem. You know, because at the end of the day, we look at individuals. That's um, seven, that's FDC, so and so, so and so. But what do they stand for when it comes, for example, on the economy, on workers' rights, on the environment? So when you look at um, uh, the politics now in Europe, in the US, because we have what we call the right and, and the, the left. left. Mm -hmm. Most of the governments are going to the right because they are looking inwards. It's about the economy, you know. The leftists usually look at workers' rights, the environment, look at human the immigrants, rights. human rights, looking at globally how do we help eh? the poor, you know, the right. It's about us, the economy. Those immigrants are going to take our land, our, our jobs, you know. So, so you find because of these challenges of the economy, the right, the right is taking over in, in Europe, you know. That's why you see Netanyahu in Israel is also, it's also now the Prime Minister, La Pen, you look at what's happening in Italy, in Italy the lady, yes. they are right, you know. The right, they are not right in being that mm, they are wrong, they but in the right, yeah, eh? yeah, the right. rightist, eh? mm, yes. not leftist. What should we learn from those issues going on? What we should learn is knowing what, what we are standing for. Mm? I'm not saying we should be also rightist, eh? but I think we need to be able, our parties our, should define what we stand for, you know, that if it's our economy, what are we standing for, you know, as an economy? What are, what are these parties standing for when it comes to the workers' rights, when, when it comes to agriculture? Are you in for small-scale producers or do you want FDI 
the For investors mm. to remove every border on the land, give it to investors so that the investors employ our people on peanuts. What are you standing for? In fact, what you, that issue have raised is very important. It also helps us as citizens to be able to, to educate ourselves, to say, mm, I want to support this party because this party has my interests. But today, I don't see that. And that's why we don't have a clear direction. And that's why in, 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 in UK, now there are all these changes. You know, you, you sit in the chair, you have failed to address these challenges, go out. But for us, we lament, things are very bad. But we don't know what to ask because we don't know. You know, so that issue also of civic political education of our people is lacking. Yes. We don't know even what to demand from our members of parliament. We say we are poor, but why are you poor? You know, why are you poor? What policies do you want government to implement to get us out of poverty? Yes, I'm afraid we have a few minutes, like mm -hmm. uh, three, but in those, uh, just your parting shot, and maybe you would conclude what should an average Ugandan do to stay afloat <laughs> in these times, in just, in just as your parting shot this morning. Uh, for me, I, I don't think, I, for an African, uh, uh, for a Ugandan, <laughs> yes. I don't know. If for a Ugandan, I, I, I know more Ugandan. It's a matter of hustling. Don't look at just one job hustle, you know. They are land, get some land in the, in somewhere, grow your food, grow your cassava, you know. Be self-reliant, you know. I went somewhere in Dar es Salaam. Somebody has, they don't grow, they don't buy tomatoes. They don't buy onions, you know, the vegetables, you know. In the compound, just, you know, your compound, you know, as you supplement your income, the things are very hard. But to government and to civil society and Ugandans, I think we need to rethink our economic development model and the entire development model. We need to rethink where we put our money and we need to engage our government on how they are using our resources because that's our money. That loan which was got from wherever it was got, that's Ugandan money. Because we are the people who are going to pay that money. So we need to demand from our members of parliament, demand that that money should be used, if it has already been got, should be used prudently. And not, I don't know whether there is a, a chance to reorganize how that money is going to be used, but let us debate on how we use our resources. Oh, thank you very much, Madam Jane Nalunga from Siatini for being with us this morning and taking us through this very important topic. And I look forward to having more time to discuss economics and how our nation moves forward economically. Well, that has been... Thank you. Yes, uh, that has been Twitter jobs this morning on the topical discussion. We've been discussing the state of Uganda's economy. Brilliant uh, discussion this morning on how our country can keep afloat. I've been Heston Munara of Sunrise at Sea this morning. I'd like you to follow this discussion on all our social media platforms. And I'd like to wish you a good morning and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.